By the middle of 1850, the Babi resistance in Zanjan was rapidly crumbling. In other places too, the Bab's followers were increasingly subjected to harassment. The uncompromising policy of the new Prime Minister, Amir Kabir, was far less accommodating than Akasi's stratagem. It aimed at eradication of a so-called heresy whose members, isolated and demoralized, were held responsible for the country's general state of turmoil. The suppression of the Babi defensive resistance in Tamarsi and Meiriz boosted the government's morale and in turn prepared the ground for the execution of the Bab. But even as late as June 1850, a few days before his fateful departure for Tabriz, the Bab still attracted new followers, especially in the region's neighboring Sharik. The Russian agent, Moshinin, who was touring the province, saw the Bab in Sharik standing in the upper chamber of the castle teaching his doctrine to the crowd. A few days after Moshinin's visit, the Bab was transferred to Tabriz. By the time the Bab reached Tabriz on June 19th, 1850, Amir Kabir had already come to the conclusion that his execution was the only way to prevent future Babi insurgencies. The religious intensity of the Babi resistance in Tabarsi and Neriz, as well as the ongoing uprising in Zanjan, convinced him as to the symbolic place the Bab reserved in the minds of his followers. By eliminating their leader, he hoped to demonstrate to the Babis and their sympathizers the futility of any future defiance of the overriding power of the state. Failure to do so, he argued, would send the wrong signal to the remnants of the Babi forces and to the population at large. The approval of the ulama of Tabriz was of crucial importance to Amir Kabir, who needed to legitimize his decision by their legal ratification. The ulama were reluctant to extend their blessing to a man who in a short time gained the reputation of being both anti-clerical and a skillful maneuverer. Amir Kabir's anti-clerical policies had already alienated many mujtahids, especially in Tabriz. There were other reasons for the mujtahids to withhold the reissuance of the Bab's death warrant. Their fear of Babi retaliation could not be underestimated at a time when 5,000 Babis were still fighting a long and bloody war against the government troops in so close a location as Zanjan. If the government had taken it on itself to wipe out the Babis, there was no need for the ulama to be in the forefront of the campaign. With the Tabriz ulama reluctant to associate themselves with the government's action, the state authorities saw a little alternative but to stage a mock trial with the obvious aim of confirming the condemnation of the Bab. The ulama had already voiced their refusal to participate in another inquisitorial gathering. Even Hamza Mirza, the new prince governor of Azerbaijan, who ordered that the Bab be brought to a small gathering of state officials, was unwilling to risk his reputation and his lucrative governorship on an obviously unpopular task. He must have felt indignant at being saddled with the responsibility of putting to death a Sayyid in a faction-ridden city for the sake of adding credit to the career of an ambitious minister whose reform measures had already reduced the privileges of the Qajar elite. Faced with Hamza Mirza's reservations, Amir Kabir instructed his brother to carry out the reconfirmed orders from the capital for the Bab's execution. By bypassing the governor and placing the matter directly into the hands of the army, Amir Kabir hoped to force through his order and secure the Mujtahid's consent. After some hard negotiation, Vazir Nizam, aided by Amir Kabir's special envoy and troubleshooter, succeeded in inducing the leaders of both clerical factions to ratify the death penalty. The Bab was executed by firing squad on July 9th, 1850, in a barracks square in Tabriz, in the seventh year of his ministry. The 
Martyrdom of the Bob took place at noon on Sunday, July 9th, 1850. Thirty years, eight months, and twenty days from the day of his birth in Shiraz. The miraculous happenings which accompanied this tragic event have been recorded for posterity in the Dawnbreakers and retold in other literary forms to touch the hearts of millions. Writing in the American Periodical Forum in 1925, the French literary critic Jules Bois recalls, All Europe was stirred to pity and indignation. Among the literateurs of my generation in the Paris of 1890, the martyrdom of the Bob was still as fresh a topic as had been the first news of his death in 1850. Sarah Bernhardt entreated Catul Mendes for a play on the theme of this historic tragedy. A Russian poetess of St. Petersburg published a drama in 1903 entitled The Bob. It was performed a year later in one of the principal theaters of that city, was subsequently given publicity in London, was translated into French in Paris and into German by the poet Fiedler, was presented again soon after the Russian Revolution in the Folk Theater in Leningrad and succeeded in arousing the genuine sympathy and interest of the renowned Tolstoy, whose eulogy of the poem was later published in the Russian press. In his book, Seyyid Ali Muhammad called the Bab, published in Paris in 1905, the renowned French scholar A.L.M. Nicolas wrote the following. His life is one of the most magnificent examples of courage, which it has been the privilege of mankind to behold, and is proof of the love which he felt for mankind. He sacrificed himself for humanity. For it he gave his body and his soul, for it, he endured privations, insults, torture, and martyrdom. He sealed with his very life blood the covenant of universal brotherhood. Like Jesus of Nazareth, he paid with his life for the proclamation of universal concord and brotherly love. He knew what dreadful dangers awaited him. He foresaw his own death at the hands of ignorance, pretentious power, and fanaticism. But all these forebodings did not weaken his resolve. Fear had no hold upon his soul. And perfectly calm, never looking back, in full possession of all his powers, he walked into the furnace. Another notable eulogy of the Bob was written by the Reverend Dr. T.K. Cheney, an Anglican priest and prestigious Oriel Professor of the Interpretation of Holy Scripture at Oxford University from 1885 to 1908. He became a Baha'i after meeting Abdul Baha during his visit to Oxford in 1912. In his book, The Reconciliation of Races and Religions, he wrote, We call him prophet, for want of a better name, for he was more than a prophet. His combination of mildness and power is so rare that we have to place him in a line with supernormal men. We learned that at points in his career, after he had been in an ecstasy of revelation, such radiance of might and majesty streamed from his countenance that none could bear to look upon him. Nor was it an uncommon occurrence for unbelievers involuntarily to bow down in lowly obeisance on beholding his holy person. The story of the Bab was the story of spiritual heroism unsurpassed in our experience. He was one of those rarities in human history. 
If a young man of 24 could, in only six years of ministry, so inspire rich and poor, cultured and illiterate, so that they would remain steadfast, though hunted down and without trial, sentenced to death, tortured, strangled, dismembered, and blown from guns. His doctrine and his life are truly worthy of study. In June 1851, the Prime Minister, Mirza Taki Khan, Amir Kabir, summoned Baha'u'llah and told him that he was well aware of his activities and influence among the Babis, and was firmly convinced that he supported Mullah Hussein and his companions at Tabarsi, because without outside assistance they would not have been able to resist for seven months the forces of the imperial government. Amir Kabir said that he admired Baha'u'llah's ability to direct and encourage those efforts, but admitted that he was unable to uncover any evidence of Baha'u'llah's complicity. He then offered Baha'u'llah a position with the government, possibly to entice him to suspend his support of the Babi community. He suggested that Baha'u'llah leave Tehran and visit Karbala during the time that the Shah was planning a trip to Isfahan, and that on the Shah's return, he would arrange to confer upon Baha'u'llah the administrative position of head of the royal court, or Amir i Divan, which he felt Baha'u'llah could discharge admirably. Baha'u'llah thanked the Amir for his consideration, but refused to accept the government position. A few days after that interview, he left Tehran for Karbala. It was during Baha'u'llah's absence that some of the more radical leaders of the Babi community in Tehran planned the assassination of Naziruddin Shah. The disastrous military defeats in the fortress of Tabarsi and the towns of Neriz and Zanjan had left the remnant of the Babis badly demoralized. Given the messianic epiphany that characterized the movement and the interpretation by some of the events that were to accompany the advent of the Mahdi, it is also not surprising that retaliation for the execution of the Bab preoccupied the minds of the remaining Babi activists in spite of the numerous writings and admonitions which forbade violence and interference in matters of state. While Baha'u'llah was in the holy city of Karbala in Iraq, the site of the tomb of the Imam Hussein, he devoted himself to the task of reviving the energies and organizing the efforts of the Bab's scattered companions. He was the sole light amidst the darkness that encompassed the bewildered disciples who had witnessed the martyrdom of their beloved leader and the tragic decimation of their companions. He alone was able to inspire them with the courage and fortitude to endure the many afflictions that were heaped upon them and prepare them for the perils they were soon to face. Amir Kabir's joint control of the army and the administration combined with his near total supervision over the Shah, mobilized a common front against him. Mahd Ulya led the Qajar nobility in its resistance to Amir Kabir's dual policy of reducing privileges and, more unacceptable, distancing the Shah from his relatives. She was joined in her opposition by Mirza Aka Khan Nuri, Amir Kabir's lieutenant and partner in the government. Amir Kabir's exacting attitude made his premiership seem a reign of terror, complete with a secret service, political executions, and censorship. Nor did his uncompromising dealings with foreign envoys win him allies in either the Russian or the British camp. 
Much of what has been preserved in official accounts confirms his lack of flexibility in a system founded on negotiation and compromise. Ultimately, Amir Kabir was dismissed and replaced by Mirza Aka Khan Nouri. Nouri's appointment was a remarkable victory for Mahdulia and in effect for all the Qajar nobility. It was also a victory for Nouri himself and his British protector, Justin Shield. The Queen Mother managed to convince the Shah that his appointment would guarantee the loyalty of the army and provide the administrative skill necessary to replace Amir Kabir. No doubt the Shah was under great pressure from his mother and others to put an end to Amir Kabir. Although he had already twice issued, then cancelled, Amir Kabir's death warrant, by January 13, 1852, he was ready to act. Amir Kabir was reportedly led to believe that the royal autograph announced the end of his exile and his reinstatement in office. He entered the bathhouse of the Finn Royal Garden to prepare himself for receipt of the royal robe of honor. Instead, a prolonged and agonizing death awaited him. He was finally strangled after he had bled for several hours from opened veins in his hands and feet. The letter of remonstrance prepared by Scheel arrived too late to save Amir Kabir's life. He blamed Nuri for the fatal delay. Strenuously denying his involvement, Nuri maintained that had he expostulated with the Shah, his own life would have been threatened. The British minister could not exonerate the prime minister from connivance in the tragedy, but its principal instigator he considered to be Macht Ulya. He did not regard the Shah as equally blameworthy. His youth and the pernicious influence of his mother were considered an extenuation of his unworthy treatment of a man who had conferred so many benefits on him. Shield's explanation did not satisfy Lord Malmesbury, the foreign secretary of the new liberal government in England, which came to power shortly before the news reached London. Nor did Shield's earlier letter of remonstrance reflect adequately the new British government's repugnance with Naziridin's senseless act. Malmesbury's own letter was perhaps one of the harshest ever written in the history of Anglo-Persian relations and laid the blame squarely on the Shah. Her Majesty's government, he wrote, have learned the particulars of that shameful and barbarous transaction with feelings of the utmost horror and indignation. Malmesbury further felt obliged to point out that the commission of this crime would weaken the sentiments of goodwill which the British government entertained for Persia. The Russian protest, relayed by Chancellor Nesselrode to the Persian minister in St. Petersburg, was not as acerbic, but it was potent enough to generate a written defense from Nuri. Tsar Nicholas I himself expressed his indignation and horror upon hearing of the murder of the Shah's late minister. Neither official condemnation nor negative publicity seemed to have affected the unremorseful Naziridin who regarded it a divinely bestowed prerogative to execute his plebeian servant on suspicion of treason. Mirza Taki Khan, Amir Kabir, guilty of such infamous outrages against the Bab and his companions, met his own outrageously infamous demise. The first year of his administration was marked by the ferocious onslaught of the Imperial Army against the Babi defenders of Fort Tabarsi. He conducted that campaign of repression with ruthlessness, extinguishing the venerable lives of Mullah Hussein, Qudus, and over 300 of the noblest of his countrymen. The second year, he authorized the execution of the seven martyrs of Tehran, unleashed the offensive against Vahid and his companions in Eriz, and finally brought to a tragic end the unique life of the Bab. Such were the distinguishing features of a career that began and ended in a reign of terror such as Persia had seldom seen. Amir Kabir had forfeited through the unrelenting jealousy of his sovereign and the vindictiveness of court intrigue, 
all the honors he had enjoyed, and was treacherously put to death by royal decree only 18 months after his direct involvement in the execution of the mob. Mirza Aka Khan Nuri, the new prime minister, whose cousin had married an elder brother of Baha'u'llah, hoped to effect a reconciliation between the government and Baha'u'llah, whom he recognized as the most capable of the Bab's followers. He wrote to Baha'u'llah, asking him to return to Tehran. However, Baha'u'llah had already decided to return of his own accord. Baha'u'llah arrived in the capital in the spring of 1852. For one whole month, he was the honored guest of the Grand Vizier, who appointed his brother to act as host on his behalf. So great was the number of notables and dignitaries of the capital who flocked to meet him that he found himself unable to return to his home. He remained in that house until his departure for Shimiran, a region situated on the lower slopes of the Elburz Mountains, which serve as a summer residence for the wealthier inhabitants of Tehran. It was during this time that Baha'u'llah met with Sheikh Ali Turshizi, surnamed Azim, who had been trying for some time to see Baha'u'llah and apprise him of his secret plans. In that interview, Azim was advised in the most emphatic terms to abandon the plan he had conceived to assassinate the Shah. Baha'u'llah condemned his designs, dissociated himself entirely from the act it was his intention to commit, and warned him that such an attempt would precipitate fresh disasters of unprecedented magnitude. Baha'u'llah proceeded to Lavasan, and was staying in the village of Afche, the property of the Grand Vizier, when the news of the attempt on the life of Naziridin Shah reached him. That criminal act was committed in the early morning of August 15, 1852, just outside the Niyavaran summer residence of the Shah, as he was about to set out for a shooting excursion in the valleys of northern Tehran. The Shah was only slightly wounded, but a storm of public anger swept the nation. Without even the pretense of an inquiry into the matter, the entire Babi community was implicated. An army of implacable enemies, just waiting for an opportunity to discredit and annihilate the nascent faith, had finally been afforded a pretext. The reign of terror that ensued was revolting beyond description. Some 20,000 Babis perished in a series of massacres throughout Persia. News of these pogroms echoed as far as the capitals of Europe and was reported in the European press. Nuri's brother, Jafar Kuli Khan, who was in Shimiran when the attempt on the Shah's life was made, immediately contacted Baha'u'llah and acquainted him with what had happened. He reported that the Shah's mother was denouncing him openly as the would-be murderer of her son. She was also trying to involve Mirza Aki Khan Nuri in the affair, accusing him of being an accomplice. Baha'u'llah was urged to remain where he was until the passion of the people had subsided. An old and experienced messenger was sent to Afche to assist Baha'u'llah and to accompany him to whatever place of safety he might desire. However, Baha'u'llah refused to flee. Instead, he rode out the next morning to the headquarters of the Imperial Army, which was then stationed in Niavaran in the Shimaran district. Arriving at the village of Zarkande, the seat of the Russian legation, a short distance from Niavaran, he was met by Mirza Majid, his brother-in-law, and secretary to the Russian minister, Prince Dmitri Dolgorukov. Mirza Majid invited him to stay at his home, which adjoined the legation. The news of the arrival of Baha'u'llah surprised the officers of the Imperial Army. Naziridin Shah himself was amazed at the bold and unexpected step which a man who was accused of being the chief instigator of the attempt on his life had taken. He immediately sent one of his trusted officers to the legation, demanding that the accused be delivered into his hands. Dolgorukov refused, but asked Baha'u'llah to go to the home of the Grand Vizier, where he thought he'd be safe. The minister asked the Grand Vizier to protect Baha'u'llah, warning that he would hold him responsible for his safety. 
Mirza Aka Khan received Baha'u'llah with respect, but was too concerned for his own safety to accord his guests the protection expected. Baha'u'llah was arrested in Niavaran and conducted with the greatest humiliation to the capital. Stripped of his garments, barefooted and bareheaded, he was compelled to walk the entire distance from Shimaran to the dungeon in Tehran. All along the way he was pelted with stones and vilified by the crowds who were convinced that he was the sworn enemy of their sovereign. 